When I first set out to make this video, I wanted to talk about Operation Northwoods, about the 15-page document drafted by the highest-ranking members of the military, which contained plans to falsely justify a war with Cuba through false flag attacks. But the more I researched, the more I looked into the men behind Operation Northwoods, the more I read military personnel files, obituaries, and declassified documents, I started to see another story take shape. A story far larger than just 15 pages. The events that took place in March of 1962 would have far-reaching consequences that would forever alter the course of history. It's a story about corruption at the highest levels of our military, and their desire to start a war at any cost, and the one man who stood in their way. The story of Operation Northwoods begins exactly two years earlier on a cold March afternoon in 1960. With the recent rise of Fidel Castro in Cuba and rumors of his friendship with the Soviet Union, President Eisenhower allocates $13 million to a CIA operation to remove him from power. By the time JFK is inaugurated in January of 1961, the invasion plan, now going by Operation Pluto, is well underway. Having promised his supporters to be tough on Cuba, Kennedy gives his seal of approval for the operation, despite his concerns. As he was a non-military man, JFK defers to the better judgment of his chiefs of staff. But later, he would come to regret it. In a meeting on February 3rd, 1961, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Lyman Limnitzer, assures Kennedy that the plan has, quote, a fair chance of ultimate success, and even if it does not achieve immediately the full results desired, could contribute to the eventual overthrow of Castro's regime. But privately, in a meeting between his staff, he apparently calculated the chance of success at closer to 20% and personally argued that the invasion plan would certainly fail. Yet Lemnitzer kept quiet when discussing his reservations with the president. has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. The United States has committed no aggression against Cuba, and no offensive has been launched from Florida or from any other part of the United States. On midnight on April 17th, the invasion force arrived at Playa Giron, which is one of the beaches located in Cuba's Bay of Pigs. And by the end of the day, 1,200 of the 1,400 troops are captured, and the rest are either killed or retreat. The invasion was a complete failure, and the U.S. can do nothing to cover up their involvement. The question now becomes why. Why did Limnitzer and other top military brass remain silent on their concerns about the operation? Well, there are two reasons for this. Number one is that the director of the CIA and leader of the Bay of Pigs operation, Alan Dulles, was an old war buddy of Limnitzer's, and they served together during World War II. The second reason is that the CIA and Joint Chiefs of Staff thought that if the invasion was a failure, it would force President Kennedy to go to war with Cuba. After Alan Dulles died, he left a series of coffee-stained confessions to a reporter, and they read, We felt that when the chips were down, when the crisis arose in reality, any action required for success would be authorized rather than permit the enterprise to fail. The realities of the situation would force the president to carry through to the end. Kennedy, however, would not do as the generals expected. And when talking to a close friend of his, Red Fay, he would say, I will never compromise the principles upon which this country is built. We are not going to plunge into irresponsible action just because a fanatical fringe in the country puts so-called national pride above national reason. Here, we can see the beginning of the roots of mistrust between Kennedy and the military. They intentionally misled him in order to try and force a war with Cuba. And from that moment on, Kennedy would never again trust people like Limnitzer and Alan Dulles. This is where Operation Northwoods is born. Here, 
the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. On one side, we have Limnitzer, Dulles, and the rest of the military, who want to start a war. And on the other side, we have JFK and his brother, who are very much opposed to open war. It's not exactly clear why Limnitzer was so hungry for war. He did not leave behind many resources that clearly state his position on the subject, whether it was about glory or the greater good, but there are a few sources we can look at that gives us a glimpse into his goals. I stumbled upon another declassified document that was written just about a month before Operation Northwoods was drafted. It was written by the Joint Secretaries F.J. Bluen and Michael J. Ingolito, and later approved by Limnitzer himself. It was titled, A Note by the Secretaries on Biological and Chemical Weapons and Defense Programs. In that document, which also includes the U.S. government secretly maintaining stockpiles of leftover mustard gas, it includes something called a nerve agent called Agent VX, which in 1961 was tested on volunteers, but the program was quickly shut down after they realized how dangerous it truly was. The interesting thing about this is that later in the document, it states, and I'm quoting here, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have concluded that extracontinental testing of BC weapons can be conducted adequately as an extension of continental testing under the direction of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So what we know for sure is that the military had chemical weapons that were deemed too harmful to test on American subjects, and they approved the testing of these weapons on foreigners. Obviously, this is not the only reason that people like Limnitzer wanted to start a war, but I do think that it is convenient that they were looking for an excuse to test new chemical compounds on unsuspecting foreigners. And a war with a country like Cuba would be the perfect testing ground for new compounds like Agent VX. Now, it was just a matter of finding a reason to go to war, of convincing the general public, as well as the president, that war is both necessary and justified. And since their first attempt to start a war with the Bay of Pigs incident failed, Lehman Limnitzer, who now was on the hot seat after Alan Dulles was removed from his position, was getting desperate. And that led him to draft a 15-page document called Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods contains nine different plans of varying complexity and detail. Let's go over them one by one. The first plan was basically to have American planes and warships impede on Cuban airspace in the hopes that Cuba would respond aggressively and then allow the U.S. to be able to play the role of the victim. The second plan was to covertly hire agents to act as Cuban militants and stage attacks on the U.S. base in Guantanamo Bay. They would start by spreading rumors of incoming Cuban attacks, and then the fake agents would start a riot near the main gate. Then they would blow up ammunition inside the base, start fires, sabotage aircraft, and even lob mortar shells onto the base. Then they would capture the fake Cuban fighters, and afterwards hold funerals for the mock victims. The third plan was more or less a copy and paste of the Remember the Main incident which was a reference to when a U.S. warship was destroyed in the Havana Harbor in 1898, which then propelled U.S. into war with Spain. The plan was almost an exact copy of that incident, and it also included a point about printing fake casualty lists in U.S. newspapers in order to rile up the public. The fourth plan was to sponsor a terrorist campaign in the Miami area that targeted Cuban refugees coming into the U.S., where they would plant plastic explosives and set them off in order to wound Cuban refugees. This plan also states that they would sink a boatload of Cubans, real or simulated. Then they would arrest the so-called terrorists and release the falsified documents linking them to the Castro regime. Personally, I found this plan to be the most abhorrent in the whole document because it so openly shows the outright apathy that these men had for innocent people, and especially those who were seeking to find a better life in the United States, away from communism. The fifth option 
was to have Cuban planes conduct cane burning raids on neighboring Caribbean countries like the Dominican Republic or Haiti. They would then stage a shipment of weapons from the USSR to Cuba that the US could intercept to make it look like Cuba was preparing for an all out assault. Plan number six was to take an F-86 airplane and paint it to look like a Cuban MiG aircraft and have it harass other civilian aircraft, as well as shoot down US drone planes to make it look like a Cuban fighter shot down an American plane. An interesting note about this plan is that they wrote it would take about three months to create a replica of a MiG fighter, which just goes to show that this document was not simply a stream of consciousness brainstorm. And each of these plans had additional members of the military researching the logistics of each idea to the point where they knew how long it would take to complete these tasks. Plan seven is the shortest plan in the whole document. And it only states that they could stage fake hijackings of civilian aircraft and make it look like Cuban terrorists were doing it. However, plan number eight unlike its predecessor, is by far the most convoluted plan. Basically, it was to falsify an attack on a civilian aircraft by having a group of college students charter a plane out of Jamaica or a similar country, and then halfway through the flight, land the plane at an Air Force base, and then an identical plane that was mocked up to look exactly like the one that landed would take off and resume the original flight path at which point the plane would then signal to the International Aviation Organization that they were being attacked by a Cuban MiG fighter. Then, just as it transits a mayday, the transmission would be interrupted to make it seem like the plane was shot down, at which point the International Aviation Organization would then radio the US to tell them that a civilian aircraft was shot down, which, in the words of the people who wrote this document, would save the military the trouble of having to sell the incident. The final plan involves sending four American fighter planes on a defense exercise over South Florida. They would fly over Cuban airspace, and then, during the exercise, one of the planes would broadcast a distress signal saying that he was being attacked by Cuban MiG fighters. The pilot would then land the plane at a secure base where it would be repainted to have a different tail number. At precisely the same moment, a submarine in the area would disperse plane parts, a parachute, and other debris into the water for the other pilots to see, which would then convince the unsuspecting pilots in the exercise that they just witnessed one of their planes go down. And they would return to base, believing that they just saw an act of Cuban aggression. What I find interesting about this plan is that it involves lying to American troops and tricking them into believing that the Cubans attacked. And it goes to show that they were willing to lie to anyone if it meant achieving their goal of starting a war. And now, with all nine plans in hand, Lyman Limnitzer sent off Operation Northwoods for approval to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, meaning that they authorized each and every idea in the document and were willing to follow through on every word that they typed up. After Operation Northwoods was sent to the Department of Defense, the general consensus on what happens next is that Kennedy rejected the plan, and that was the end of it. Operation Northwoods was scrapped and never heard from again. And all the other sources that cover the story of Operation Northwoods tend to end here, with Kennedy rejecting the plan and moving on with other, less clinically insane ideas. But that isn't where the story stops. In my opinion, the events that follow the draft of Operation Northwoods are where the story really starts to get interesting. On March 16, 1962, just three days after Operation Northwoods was officially submitted to the DOD, a meeting took place between Kennedy and the other top military advisors to discuss the progress of Operation Mongoose, which is the famous plan that was dedicated to assassinating Castro and fracturing his regime. I'll go into that in another video sometime, maybe, if you want to, but we'll see. Anyways. The people at this meeting were a combination of Kennedy's associates as well as General Limnitzer and some other high-ranking members of the military. The only other person of note at this meeting who I haven't talked about yet is General Maxwell Taylor. Taylor was another World War II hero, a close personal friend of both the Kennedy brothers, and Robert Kennedy even named one of his sons after him. Taylor, notably, was an outspoken critic of the nuclear response, and also was one of the people tasked by President Eisenhower to uphold the desegregation of schools during the Little Rock Crisis in Arkansas. So I guess he wasn't all bad. Anyways, 
Taylor first ingratiated himself with JFK during the fallout of the Bay of Pigs incident, where Taylor performed a post-mortem report that dissected why the operation was such a failure. And Taylor, who had retired from active service a few years earlier, was called back into action by JFK and appointed to a new position of being the president's chief military advisor, which was essentially JFK's way of bypassing people like Limnitzer and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Taylor eventually would take Limnitzer's job at the first opportunity Kenny got to remove him from power, but at the time of this meeting, he was still just an advisor to the president. Public knowledge of this meeting comes to us by way of another declassified document written by General Lansdale, who was one of the leaders of Operation Mongoose. During the meeting, there is no direct mention of Operation Northwoods, but when discussing the possibility of US intervention into Cuba, General Limnitzer states that the military had contingency plans for creating plausible pretext to use force, referring, of course, to Operation Northwoods, to which Kennedy responds bluntly that we are not discussing the use of military force at this time. The rest of the meeting is interesting, but not exactly pertinent to the story of Operation Northwoods. What I do believe are the key takeaways of this meeting, though, is that Kennedy now openly distrusts Lyman Limnitzer and disregards all of his advice, as well as is openly planning to replace him by bringing his replacement to this meeting. Another key takeaway from this meeting is that Kennedy is now soured on the idea of military intervention to stop the spread of communism. No longer does he believe that using military intervention is a plausible means of international diplomacy much to the dismay of the other men in that room. A few months later, on October 1st, 1962, Kennedy removes Limnitzer from his position as chairman of the Joint Chiefs and appoints Maxwell Taylor to the position. Then, two weeks later, on October 16th, the Cuban Missile Crisis begins. Knowing what we know now about the behind the scenes events that occurred during this crisis and how many of the top military personnel were privately pushing for Kennedy to escalate the situation, it's scary to think about what might have happened if Limnitzer, the man who thought it was justified to sink a boatload of refugees in order to start a war, was still the highest ranking member of the military. I'm not going to go too much into detail on the Cuban Missile Crisis, since that topic has been covered to death. But I do think it's important to note that Castro specifically requested Soviet aid in the form of nuclear missiles in order to deter future American invasion of Cuba as a response to the very public failure of the Bay of Pigs, which, in all honesty, was actually a smart move by Castro because the US was very much invested in the idea of invading Cuba and by having nuclear weapons, that pretty much put that all to a stop. Whether you agree with him or not, he was correct to be afraid of a US invasion. The result of the Cuban Missile Crisis was the furthering of the already growing rift between Kennedy and the military that started with his removal of popular war heroes like Lemnitzer and Alan Dulles. During the time of the crisis, they wanted Kennedy to invade Cuba, but Kennedy not only ignored him, but he chose to openly negotiate with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, which was a move that many in the military openly criticized. The other important thing to note about the fallout of the Cuban Missile Crisis is that it put an end to the idea of invading Cuba, and if the military wanted to start a war, they would need to focus on a different country. This is when their focus went from pressuring Kennedy to invade Cuba to pressuring Kennedy to invade Vietnam, which was another country ripe for a proxy war. At the time, the US already had a lot of ground troops and military advisors stationed in Vietnam, but Kennedy did not believe that military intervention was the answer to stopping the spread of the Viet Cong. And he even went as far as to compare the US occupation of Vietnam to conquests of Napoleon and Alexander the Great. Then, in October of 1963, Kennedy recommended a complete withdrawal of US troops by 1965 from Vietnam. Ironically, that would be the year U.S. troops in Vietnam would drastically increase, continuing to grow until 1968. Kennedy's decision to withdraw from Vietnam was openly despised by many people in the military, and one person went as far as to call it a complete fantasy. Nonetheless, Kennedy was hellbent on getting American troops out of the region. This is where Kennedy went from being disliked by the military to being considered a threat to national security. I think the most telling piece of information from that time comes from Kennedy's most trusted advisor, Maxwell Taylor, where during a meeting about sending 8,000 troops to Vietnam, he states that, I don't recall anyone in the room who was strongly against except one man, and that was the president. 
The president just didn't want to be convinced that this was the right thing to do. It was really the president's personal conviction that US ground troops should not go in. The one person who Kennedy trusted most of all, the man who his brother literally named his son after, the one who had consistently had his back for the past few years, was now against him. And even Taylor now saw Kennedy as a problem, as a man who would let his personal conviction get in the way of their military strategy. And Kennedy no longer had any allies in the military. Now, I'm not saying that the military assassinated the president. I don't have enough information to make that statement. I wasn't there. I'm not in any place to make such a claim with absolute certainty. But all I can do is present a timeline of events following the rejection of Operation Northwoods. In March, Kennedy rejects Operation Northwoods. Then in October, he removes Lyman Limnitzer from power prematurely. Then in the same month, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurs and Kennedy angers his chiefs of staff by ignoring their advice to invade Cuba. Then he gets cold feet on Vietnam and in the beginning of November, he sent out a request to draw up plans to end the US occupation of Vietnam, which causes him to lose the trust of Maxwell Taylor, his last ally in the room. Then two weeks later, Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas and Lyndon Johnson, an advocate of military escalation in Vietnam, is sworn in as president. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. Two days later, November 24th, Johnson makes a public statement about how the battle against communism must be joined. A few months later, in August of 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurs which is commonly considered to be the catalyst that kicked off the Vietnam War and prompted Congress to pass the Tonkin Resolution, which gave President Johnson the power to escalate the war as much as he wanted. So let's take a look at the Gulf of Tonkin incident. August 1964, an American destroyer, the USS Maddox, on patrol in the Gulf of Tonkin, exchanged fire with North Vietnamese torpedo boats. The president has asked that the destroyer force be doubled and that an air cap, a combat air patrol, be available at all times on call to it. And as I think you know, he's issued instructions that in the event of a further attack upon our vessels in international waters, we are to respond with the objective of destroying the attackers. Two days later, the ship's captain thought he was again coming under attack. One of the pilots was not so sure. Well, I was over that th those destroyers as what I uh, for over an hour and a half, below a thousand feet, lights off, watching everything they did. I could hear them ch chatting on the radio, the Maddox and the Joy. They seemed to have some uh, intermittent radar targets. I took it upon myself to get out there where they thought a boat was and try to kill it if they didn't. But it was it was fruitless, and I'd go down there and there was nothing. Ignoring the conflicting evidence, the Pentagon insisted there had been a second attack. In retaliation for this unprovoked attack on the high seas, our forces have struck the bases used by the North Vietnamese patrol craft. Johnson used the incident to push the Tonkin Gulf Resolution through Congress. It would allow the president to wage war in Vietnam. So basically, US troops got reports of attacking Vietnamese ships, then traded fire with these so-called ships for a few days before taking damage by ships that were never found or reported by anyone other than the US Navy. Sound familiar? Well, the Gulf of Tonkin incident is straight out of the Operation Northwoods playbook. In fact, it is almost a perfect execution of the third plan, which was to try and provoke fake attacks on US warships in Cuban waters by invading their space. After Kennedy, the one man who opposed Northwoods was gone, it took them less than one year to implement the strategies of Operation Northwoods, not in Cuba, which was now protected by Soviet missiles, but in Vietnam. And what came after this was one of the worst wars in US history that not only saw the US commit thousands of troops and resources, but also saw the use of chemical weapons such as napalm and Agent Orange. In the end, Limnitzer, the mastermind behind Northwoods, got everything he wanted. He got his war, and he got his platform to test out chemical weapons. All it took was the assassination of JFK for him to get it.
I believe that Operation Northwoods wasn't just a plan to falsify a war with Cuba. I believe it was a playbook that the US military used in order to get what it wanted. And what it wanted was war. And once you start to look into the men behind Operation Northwoods and the events that followed its inception, you start to see a pattern. A connected series of events that show the corruption of the US military, the true lack of morals that these men possessed, and their desire to start a war at the cost of not just the lives of foreigners, but the lives of thousands of US citizens as well. The legacy of those 15 pages called Operation Northwoods isn't simply a scrap plan to invade Cuba but it is the whole of the Vietnam War and decades of disastrous foreign policy that came after it. It's a window into just how little regard our government has for the lives of its own citizens, and it forever changed the way I think about the history of our country. Do I believe that the military assassinated JFK so they could start a war? I don't know. But what I do know is that Operation Northwoods is far more than just those 15 pages. The legacy of Operation Northwoods can be seen all across the history of the United States. So I'll leave you with this. It's an interview with President Richard Nixon referring to Lyndon B. Johnson's opinion on his bombing campaigns in Vietnam. In office, uh, I uh, saw the morning news report and I just happened casually to mention to George. He says, well, I bet you that uh, uh, the President Johnson is uh, going to be real pleased when he finds that now they're calling me the number one bomber. George Christian said, oh, don't be too sure. He said, you know, LBJ, he never likes to be number two. <laughs>